Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, beach soccer family, we are back here today to continue our journey talking about the development of our sport. And it's a pleasure for me to be here again, as I said in the first part. Uh, I expend more than 20 years in this sport. So for me to talk about the development and the beach soccer, it's a real pleasure. And today we have a very special guest again. We have Francis from US. We have Mr. Luis from El Salvador, Mr. Fred from Bahamas, and Mr. Naea from Tahiti. So let's start our presentation. Okay, so we're gonna to start today uh, with the same slides that we saw last week. Uh, the idea is because if we have someone that missed uh, last week, week we're gonna we're gonna talk again. So for us, those are the five development pillars, uh, important ones uh, to start one beach soccer project, for example. So we're going to talk a little bit about grassroots, professional formation, national competition, national team, and organization of international events. OK, we're going to talk a little bit more about each one now. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, grassroots, we talk about festivals where we can have families uh, uh, involved, youth, kids, uh, schools, and uh, for sure, uh, the USA presentation will, uh, will talk a lot about this. So that's why we have Francis here. So high schools and tournaments for youth under six, under eight, under 10, under 12, under 14, under 16, and children clinics. Children clinics, we're gonna see a little bit of this example when I talk uh, about Japan. Okay, professional formations. Uh, we talk about organizing uh, coaches course, uh, referee course, and international uh, uh, international instructor co coaches course. Okay, and then national competition. We have many examples here: amateur competition, regional competition, national league, national cup. And of course, the participation at international clubs competition. Please. Then we go for the national team, where I mention here important points like friendly games, play uh, against other teams, participation in continental events, and international events. OK, uh, organization of international events. Here we have some examples like FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup, Beach Soccer Qualifiers, Intercontinental Cup in Dubai, Olympic events, Continental Leagues and Cups, uh, like Aero Beach Soccer League, Copa America, Mundialito, BSWW Tours. Uh, we have also the clubs competition. And we have here the example Mundialito de Clubes, Euro Winners Cup, Copa Libertadores da América, World Winners Cup, and BSWW Tour for clubs. So it's very important uh, to participate and also to organize, to try to organize international events. Please, next one. So here you can see the ideal steps process that I think we have to follow, but doesn't mean that uh, the countries follow this process. And we have many examples about countries that starts sometimes from the opposite way, organizing international events and creating their national team, and maybe they finish with the grassroots. So again, this is the ideal step that I think 
we can we can start with these five pillars okay uh beach soccer activity we have now over 120 34 35 sorry countries right now it's amazing so as i said i'm more than 20 years in this sport and when i see this uh slide i'm very proud and happy that about the work that we are doing since today next one please so now we're gonna start with our guests and the first one is uh el salvador okay one country that is step by step developing a lot of the sport organizing tournaments having a good national team so just to remind you some activities some achievements that uh, el salvador had in the past so it's very important and i think the biggest one was during the ravenna fifa world cup when they finish in the fourth place in the top four teams in the world so it's really important so also i want to mention that i had the pleasure to work with uh, uh, two very good players from el salvador one is frank Velasquez and another one is Agustin uh, Ruiz during the Mundialito clubs 2011 and 2012. But I don't want to speak too much about uh, El Salvador because we have Mr. Luis Vileda here and he will present how El Salvador is improving and developing the sport. Welcome, Mr. Luis. And the words is for you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lupieda. I represent the INDES, Instituto Nacional de los Deportes del Salvador. Um, here in El Salvador, the Sport Beach Soccer is uh, the second most important uh, uh, deport uh, uh, after soccer. The beach soccer players are, are a hero here in, in, El, in El Salvador. Uh, people love them uh, uh, very much. Uh, uh, mo mo so some of them, uh, they uh, are uh, fishermen. They, they fish, fishing. We call the the, the players uh, beach warrior, Guerrero de Playa. And in this most highlight five, five actions in beach soccer, the course of referees and and, uh, and coaches, rules for children's national league. Be soccer, uh, national be soccer teams and international events. Please, the, the next slide. For coaches and referee courses, we, we are working with uh, beach soccer worldwide to make training and of coaches and referees in relationship to CONCACAF to keep training uh, the coaches. For grassroots, uh, we have training camp and clinic for young children in framework of international competition. Please, the next uh, slide. The National League. We are we are working with uh, fast food and technical staff of different national teams to develop the first national beach soccer league in representation of all Salvadorian coast. Uh, we have to study the stadium. Uh, we can work with uh, the league, uh, the Apulo in Ilopango, um, the Costa del Sol, uh, where we where we can play the Copa Indes in previous editions. We will have twelve men's teams, uh, eight women team, and Indes will provide uniforms, official ball, financial contribution. Communication promotions. It's a, a an investment of approximately two hundred thousand of dollars. Uh, next, please. Thank you. In the in the uh, in the since uh, July twenty nineteen is supporting these uh, soccer beach teams with monthly monthly economic economic incentive. Uh, financial support for the COVID-19 pandemic plus food contribution to all beach soccer national players. The government has also helped them 
when they have to lose their houses and, and or their boats because they are uh, uh, fisher, fishermen, pescadores, to the rains and since they live in most in, in, in Iceland. Uh, the next place. Thank you. International events. In, in this co is commitment to organize the annual a first class international event with national and international media covers. We have worked in, in quadrangular football player El Salvador, Copa Indes for uh, I think four years, uh, and Campeonato Football Playa de Concacaf in 2019. Uh, the World Beach Games qualify was in El Salvador, it has made history since for the first time the, the a women's beach soccer event is uh, uh, in, for, for the, the first uh, woman team was made in the in the games with the participation of six thousand people in Centro Internacional de Ferias y Convenciones. This is a theater. It's like a theater. There is a picture there, and we put some of the beaches to make the, the field, the soccer field field. Uh, it's a, a work of, a, it was a work of a three or four days to put sand and make this uh, field reglamentary with the standards of, 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 of the soccer. We will, uh, in 2020, we will make a El Salvador Beach Soccer Cup. Uh, it's a schedule to take place in one of the most important beaches in the country, it's Costa del Sol. Um, we will have one of the most important events on, of Index, the Summer Festival, with the participation of 30 different sports and beach soccer imitation tournaments. Uh, next, please. We have another one. Oh, no. Well, we believe that beach soccer is a great opportunity to show to the world that sport is a tool for social integration and cultural sport development. Uh, and that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Luis. Uh, I have just a quick comment that about uh, a long-term project. Okay, so I'm. I know that in 2008, uh, it was the first participation of El Salvador in one World Cup in France. After El Salvador played in 2009 in Dubai, both tournaments without any victory, no points. Okay. But the investment and the, continue, the continuity of the work shows that it could be important because the next one in 2011 in Havana, the team finished in the fourth position. And, in, and for me, it's a very good example for some countries that maybe the chance to achieve something like that in soccer is very difficult, but shows that in beach soccer, it could happen. It's possible. So I don't want to say small countries because all countries for me are big, but it's very important that beach soccer can give this opportunity for countries that maybe cannot achieve this success in football. Okay, so thank you very much. I don't know if you agree with me, Mr. Luis. Totally, totally, yes, yes. It's, it's true. Oh. Okay, thank you. So the next one, we're gonna talk about Bahamas. I had the pleasure to, to be there and participate in the Bahamas World Cup. I had the pleasure to know this beautiful country, to visit this beautiful country. The World Cup wasn't very good for me, as a coach, but uh, in terms of uh, tourism and, and, and place, it was amazing experience and the World Cup was very well, very well organized, Mr. Fred. And I want to, and I'm following very close because Coach Escobar is a good friend of mine. 
and I'm following very close the work that you are running. And uh, it's important for us to give the word for the word for you, and to talk a little bit about what you are doing after this beautiful World Cup that we we had. Thank you, and please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Marcelo. I um, appreciate those kind words, and I'm sure the disappointment in the Bahamas was probably overcome by the beauty of the country and what you enjoyed while you were here. So thank you very much for those kind, kind words. Uh, can we go to the first slide? Um, I wanted to start out today by this uh, simple quote from our President Antoine Sealy, which relates to our development program in the Bahamas. And Anton said that together with our partners, we can grow faster and better. And without the support of the, uh, the president for this particular sport, I don't think we'd be where we are today. So a lot of what we have done in the country has been because of his leadership in terms of support of, of, of being stalker over the many years. And if you can go to the next slide for me, please. And when I refer to many years, I'm gonna give you a brief little history of where we started kind of where we are today and then where we will be uh, moving forward in the future. And for us, beach soccer started really kind of in 1992 with an article that I came across in the uh, Sports Illustrated magazine and it was entitled Samba in the Sand. I, I, I've never heard about soccer being played on sand or played on the beaches. We just knew about grass soccer at the time, but also it was an interesting time for my club because we were always looking for some ways to raise money so that uh, um, our grass team can travel and, and have some fun. So I took the idea to my club in, uh, in 1993, we decided that we were gonna host our very first beach soccer tournament. And to our surprise, this event netted us some $10,000. And it was just a festival with music and the food and all things that we see today. But the article that I read earlier referred to that. So we built it around the article and it was a tremendous success. If you take note of the second photograph on the top line, you can uh, tell that we didn't know a whole lot about beach soccer. The player in the picture, if you notice, he's wearing tennis shoes. So that was part of our rules. We didn't have rules to go by, so we made them up and they can play with tennis shoes. Bicycle kicks were not allowed. The ball above the head was a foul. You could not enter the penalty area. And the goalkeeper, which might be similar today, we had an idea. He only had 10 seconds to get the ball back in play. Uh, so we invented the rules, and for many years, these are rules that we were governed by. Um, through the, the mid-90s and going into the 2000s, uh, we had festivals every year. Uh, we had some 46 teams of men and women that played the sport. And then we eventually introduced what we said, you know, youth teams, which today is our grassroots. And some of those young men and women that played then are the foundation of our national teams today. In 2005, um, FIFA invited uh, President Sidney and myself to attend the Beach Soccer World Cup in Rio de Janeiro. Wow, what a spectacular event, spectacular sport, the energy, the excitement. And of course, we realized that how we were playing the game in the Bahamas was not correct. For the first time, you know, we saw the bicycle kicks, we saw the scissors kicks, uh, fantastic goals, the energy, the crowd, the, the passion of this. So for us, the process had to change. And we realized also that an investment in this sport for a small country like the Bahamas could net tremendous benefits for us in the future in terms of our men's national team having the opportunity to play at a high level, some of the best countries in the world and some of the best players in the world. So we decided in 20, 2007 that we were going to request a FIFA beat soccer course. And FIFA, of course, accommodated us, came in, and for the first time we were sort of taught how to play the game correctly by the rules um, and how, how the game should be played. And it was fantastic uh, for us to embark on this new uh, journey to develop the sport in the country. We continue to use the sport though to raise money for charities in our country, very similar to what BSWW were doing their foundation. We supported them as well, every chance we had. I mentioned Kick for a Cure here because there's a little girl in the Bahamas at the time was fighting cancer. And the event raised us over $30,000 uh, to donate to help her. So, you know, the linkages in terms of raising funds, raising the awareness for different causes, this would beat soccer brought to us at the time. We went on to participate in our first qualifiers in Porta Vallarta. And it was that 
particular tournament that made us realize that, while wow, we really could compete with the big countries in the world. Because uh, the draw was the Bahamas against the United States, the opening match. And of course, I was then thinking, you know, Lord, why the United States couldn't have been someone else that we could play Costa Rica, but we got the US. To our surprise, we scored the first goal in three seconds. Because at that point, we realized that this game will be good for us and we can move on and develop. The following year, we went uh, to an invitation tournament in Dominican Republic. We actually won the tournament, which gave us a little more inspiration to continue to develop the sport. Now, it's okay to play it at home, it's okay to go to the tournaments, but it's all about the rankings and how we can move up in the rankings. So in 2011, we made a conscious decision to try to improve our rankings. So we employed over the years some of the best coaches that beat soccer has to offer. We worked with Roberto Siciliano, we worked with Angelo Skorinski, we worked with Alex Suarez, and presently right now, as Marcelo said earlier, his very good friend, Luis Escobar, who is doing a fantastic job in, in, in building the sport from grassroots up, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? Our rankings did go from, I think, 135 countries now in the world that we are now ranked uh, 31 in the world. And so the investment has really been paying off for us. And through in 2013, uh, we hosted the CONCAP qualifiers in the Bahamas. And we were nervous about this because we had an, uh, a stadium put in and uh, great, 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 great events. Uh, we've hosted in the past, but in this particular case, we had a tremendous turnout of spectators and followers that really enjoyed the sport. We went on um, later on in that year to play in the River Maya Cup in Mexico, an invitational cup that we were invited to. We got the opportunity to really play against Brazil, Spain, Mexico, Bahamas. What a great opportunity, great ticket. I joke with Luis all the time that the Bahamas won the game against Brazil because we scored two goals. The score was 10 to two, but the two goals was enough for us to say, you know, we actually got two goals in the best team in the world. So that was exciting for our team. They came back, we worked very hard. We went to the CONCACAF qualifiers in El Salvador and finishing six in that, that particular tournament. Um, and we moved on to now focusing on hosting the World Cup. We were very fortunate in our bid to win the World Cup in the Bahamas for 2017. And we had a few years to prepare our team. A major part of that preparation was spending six weeks in Switzerland, in Europe, playing against some of the top teams in Europe, playing against some of the top countries in Europe. I know, Francis, you're coming up next in the presentation, but I have to mention that's the first time in our history, and we've had a few matches with the United States, but we actually won a game over the US. And this is uh, proof that small countries who want to embark on this journey of developing beach soccer may not be able to achieve this on the grass pitch, but we certainly achieved that, that win for us on sand. And it was a fantastic match and great for our players and great for the country. Uh, we went on to now, um, in 2018, we did the Bahamas Cup. We were in the process of putting it together for this year as well. Of course, the current pandemic uh, that we're going through has put that on hold and we'll see where we go once we, we get back and running again. Um, <clears throat> for the first time, our women uh, played in the World Beach Games, and this was a tremendous first step for our women's development program. Um, Luis, I, I give him a lot of credit for what he's done with our, our women's program here, and we had told him, just keep training, just keep playing, and the world of beach soccer will open up to you. And sure enough, they were ready and got the invitation to go to the, the World Beach Games uh, and play in El Salvador. And then they follow that up with the Pro-Am Games in the United States. And we see more development and more games coming for our women as we develop our women's programs. Um, Marcelo mentioned the World Cup and that really was a fantastic experience for this country. Um, and I'll just give you a few statistics here, uh, two in particular that links this sport to tourism and how important it is for a country like the Bahamas is based on tourism. In the CONCACAF, qualifiers in 2017, prior to the World Cup, we hosted in Bahamas. We had 42,875 people attend those matches. But what was surprising to all of us, and it's such a, 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 a boost for this country in terms of tourism, we had 19,456,089,000 people watch these games 
coming out of the Bahamas. Now, in terms of our Minister of Tourism and our government, this is spectacular for us. And it says that we want the right track in terms of taking this sport to the world and bringing the world to the Bahamas. Moving forward and building on what our success in the, the World Cup, our men's and women's program is going to be taking off. We did uh, host a uh, league, men's and women's league uh, last year for the first time, it was very successful. And we had planned to do it this year and hopefully we can get back to that once we come out of the, uh, the COVID um, lockdown. We are also launching our coaches and refereeing uh, program. And that's being done again with Luis uh, directing a particular uh, um, um, program for us. We have 27 schools, primary schools will be up from grades six to 12, that'll be in that program. And that will be run every day uh, during the week. And that will culminate in festivals on weekends. We expect that to be a successful uh, um, kickoff for us. And we're going to be launching uh, just our logo for that in particular that says, let's play beach soccer. And that's how we're gonna brand it, you know, here in the Bahamas, that's how we're gonna promote this to the children of the country. And uh, we're looking forward to launching that particular um, program is just in a few weeks. We have a beautiful state of art stadium here that um, obviously was constructed to host the World Cup. We're gonna use that uh, particularly uh, stadium to host events, um, to develop our program, uh, to host our training in this particular event itself. And um, I just wanna mention, there's a photograph in the middle bottom row. There's a gentleman in the Bahamas called Larry Mins. For some reason, Larry, when, when there was beach soccer, he will, like Superman, duck into somewhere and he reappears as Captain Bahamas. And he was a great inspiration to our events to get the crowd going. And people know about Larry around the world. He has his own little video. I think that beach soccer worldwide helped put out there for him. So he's a great part of what we do in the Bahamas and our development. Uh, in my closing, I just want to say that beach soccer has given us the opportunity to take our team, our culture, the Bahamas to the world. We've won a few games, we've lost a few games, but all, overall this has been a win for the Bahamas. I wanna say a special thanks to uh, BSWW for organizing these events, more importantly to inviting us to play in these events. I uh, wanna say thank you to CONCACAF and FIFA and the government of the Bahamas because without their financial support and the belief in this particular sport, we would not see our men ranked at 31 in the world, our women at 15, and we're certainly shooting to be in the top 10 very soon. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And if there are any questions, I'm sure Marcelo can answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much for your presentation. And again, uh, Bahamas for me is a good example to how to use the legacy after one World Cup. So continue developing the sport. Now you have the women team, so in grassroots. So yes. I'm 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 happy to see how you are growing, and I think soon the results will come inside the field also. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fred. Thank you. Okay, so after that, next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna have now my good friend. Francis Faberhoff. I normally call him my capitano. He was the captain of Seattle Sanders when I had the pleasure to coach him for the first time. And I'm following also his work now with the, the girls in the US. He's doing a great job. Francis, uh, welcome. And uh, please explain for us, how is the beach soccer now in the US? What is going on, my friend? Please, go ahead. Marcelo, how are you? Hi, everybody. Luis, Fred, Nae. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. So the U.S. is a little bit different than other countries in the world. You know, the, we have a phenomenon. We have a lot of youth tournaments, a lot of pro-am tournaments. So tournaments where you have every age group from seven, eight-year-old kids all the way to veterans, co-ed, mix, pro so there's, a, there's tournaments where you have a massive amount of people playing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's, what we've been doing in this couple of years. So first I'll talk about the men's team. Okay. 
uh, some of the things we've done with the men's national team is we do regionalized talent ID camps. So basically what we do is we go to different areas, as you can see there, like Virginia Beach, Houston, Fort Lauderdale, Grand Haven, Huntington Beach. And we do camps where we invite players that either through coaches or when we go to this tournament, we identify them, we invite them to this talent ID camp so we can see if they have the level and the potential to be in the national team. So this is something we've done in, with the last cycle. And, and out of that, we actually had, you know, players that, that made, uh, made it all the way to the World Cup qualifiers, some big tournaments. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very effective method. Also, we scout this tournament that I was mentioning, like the tournament in Virginia Beach. There's other tournaments in California. There's tournaments in Florida, uh, you know, Oceanside. Also, there's tournaments in Michigan. So, you know, we go to these tournaments to look for talented players in the pro division. Not, and then if we see a player that's talented, then we go ahead and invite him to those, to those camps. Uh, also, we have uh, – national and international training camps. So most of our national training camps, we do them in Huntington Beach and sometimes in Fort Lauderdale. Huntington Beach is in California and here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So some of the East Coast and the West Coast, because you know the US is very big and we have a lot of coasts. You know, we have the East and the West Coast. So we try to take advantage of that. Also, usually California and Florida, the weather is always good. You know, all year round, there's good weather that you can train on the beach. Uh, also, we've done international training camps where we go to other countries and or we host other countries. Like when you were the coach of Japan, that you came to for Lauderdale and we played against you guys three friendly official matches. We trained. So, you know, that, that, I, that I think is also something very productive. We've done that with Switzerland. Also with Japan, we went to Japan, uh, Tahiti. We did that with Argentina, with Italy. So not only playing against national teams, but sometimes you play against club teams as well. So you do an international training camp. So the team is together training and then you, you play against other teams and you get, you know, good competition. This is also something that has been effective for us. And then also we have the international official tournaments where we, you know, we go, we go to, you know, like the World Cup, Copa America, the qualifiers, Copa Pilsen, El Salvador, Dubai, the annual games, the Mundialito, the Balanto Cup. So those are different international terms that we played throughout the last couple of years that has helped tremendously our, our sport get visibility in the U.S. and also to develop and to find new, new talents. Uh, next page. Marcelo, next page, please. Okay. Thank you. Now I'll, talk a little, uh, now I'll talk a little bit about the women's program, which is fairly new. The women's program was recently launched in, uh, in the World Beach Game qualifiers in El Salvador that we recently played. So that's the first time that we had a women's team. And it was very exciting because there's a lot of talent in the U.S. in the women's side. I think, you know, in the outdoor U.S. is, you know, the team with the most tradition in outdoor. So I think we have the potential to be one of the strongest teams in the world. So what we are doing to, to get there is we are doing similar to the men. We're, we're starting with regionalized talent ID camps. Uh, as you can see there, there's a flyer. We were supposed to have one in March in San Francisco, but unfortunately it, it was right before the weekend of the, of the COVID when everything started. It was March uh, 13, 14, and 15. But that's our plan to do San Francisco, Virginia, for Lauderdale, Grand Haven, Huntington, to do different talent ID camps where we invite the players, the women players, they, they have potential to be in the national team. Uh, also, we scout the players in national team tournaments like Virginia, US Open. We recently had a tournament in San Diego where, you know, Fred mentioned that the Bahamas came to play. And we have very, very, very strong US club teams where I was able to see a lot of talented players. So that's, that's also another way. And we've had domestic, very few because it's very new, but we've had a domestic camp in Oceanside, in Huntington, uh, in, in last year. And some of the tournaments we had with the women, we had the qualifiers, which we came out in second place. And then, you know, we were invited to Qatar to play in the World Beach Games, which was an amazing experience, you know, where we had eight teams, we, we finished in fifth place. So, you know, it was just the beginning of, of the Women's Beach Soccer Program. Um, next slide, Marcelo. 
so like I was telling you guys a little bit of the phenomenon in the U.S. is that we have a lot of youth and adult beach soccer tournaments all over the U.S., Florida, Virginia, California. We have, you know, even uh, Michigan, uh, you know, and, and every, every time is growing more. We have Maryland now. We have New York. So everywhere where there's a beach or there's a space to play, people are starting to do beach soccer tournaments in the summer because like, like Fred from the Bahamas was saying, a lot of outdoor clubs see this as an opportunity to fundraise money for their clubs in the summer because most of the leagues here in the U.S. run from, uh, you know, from the fall, which is, let's say, August, September to May. So in the summer, you know, in some areas is a, is a downtime, is vacation. So what, they, what a lot of clubs are doing, they're creating these tournaments in the summer so, you know, a lot of the kids go out and play, and that's where I think the, the sport has a lot of potential here. You can go to the next slide, Marcelo. Um, the biggest tournament that we have in the world in beach soccer festival is, is the tournament in, in Virginia Beach. It's called the North American Sand Soccer Championship. This is an amazing tournament. The tournament started in 1993, and I believe they had 18 teams at, at the first year. Now it's a tournament that has 1,000 teams. A thousand teams, imagine this, in one weekend. Tournament is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, you have over 10,000 players. You have amateur. You have women's, men, uh, senior, uh, you know, veterans, over 40, over 30. You have the pro division where they built two stadiums. They have a cash prize of like $15,000 for the champion. So, you know, it's, it's a tournament that is an amazing environment of, of beach soccer. It's over 20 blocks, as you can see in the picture there. Imagine 20 blocks of soccer, of beach soccer fields. This is what this tournament is. If you can go to the next page, Marcelo, you can have a better idea of how it looks. And you, as you can see there, you know, all the division, boys, girls, uh, pro stadium. Uh, they have the women's division, the men's division. Last year, for the first time, they had a women's cash prize. So I believe it was $5,000 for the women's champion, which I think is amazing. Um, so this, this is something that where, where for us is, is great for the sport, this kind of tournaments. But it's not only this one. We have other ones. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Marcelo, please. Uh, you have some images there from Virginia Beach. And you have teams from all over the world. You have always there's a kids clinic with hundreds of kids. You have Barcelona that has been there. You have a team from Colombia that always goes. Antioquia Beach Soccer. You've had, you know, many, many superstars have played there, like Neneim. Uh, Major, Junior Negao, it's it's I would you know a lot of a lot of names the legends from beach soccer have played in this tournament. If you can go to the next slide, please, Marcelo. Also, we have another tournament that is like the the brother of this tournament is a smaller version, but it's very big too. It's called the uh, Oceanside Tournament, the Pro Am Tournament in Oceanside. This is an amazing tournament that uh, Frank does over there. And it used to be Gino as well. They set up two stadiums and they also have a pro division. And they have, like you can see, there are 28 cores, 300 teams, and all the divisions, you know, U8, U9, uh, all the way to U19, you know, high school. It, it's, it's a pretty, pretty amazing environment. And, and I know there's been years where you have, you actually had basically a Mundialito there where you had teams from the United Arab Emirates, teams from Japan, you had teams from Italy. So it was, it, it was, it's also an amazing tournament where the champion also gets a cash prize. So this is another example of what we have in the U.S. Uh, there's other tournaments. There's a Pro-Am tournament that they do in California that they have stages all over the U.S. And then every winner gets invited to the final stage, which last year was in San Diego. Uh, and there's also the Soccer in the Sand tournament, which is another series of tournaments. So there's multiple tournaments that we have here. Uh, next slide, Marcelo, please. So as you can see there, Oceanside, you see, you know, you had teams from Brazil, Botafogo, you know, it's just an amazing, amazing environment. Um, so that's a little bit of the US, you know, we have, you know, again, we have this big tournaments, but there's a lot of stuff that we can, it's, it's different than the other tournaments, like you said, Marcelo, some countries start with the, the, the courses, the league, you know, and so maybe we go the other way around, but I think we have a lot of potential and there's a lot of beach soccer being played here in the U.S., okay? And 
thank you very much for this opportunity and hope to see you guys soon. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. I had the I had the pleasure to to be in Oceanside <laughs> once, and it's really incredible how they can organize something like that. I never been in Virginia, it's the biggest one. I hope to be there once. But I have a, I have one question for you, Francis. So all of all all of those activities are organi not organized by the US soccer, right? So correct? Correct. The the tournaments are not the the first portion of the presentation is organized by US soccer, but the tournaments are independent. They are independent, but they are some of them are supported by US soccer. You know, and Okay. So in in so my opinion is I can you can you think what will going to happen to you in US if the US soccer comes on board 100% and support these tournaments? Uh, it, it, it will be amazing to see that because, in my opinion, US has a huge potential, huge potential, even in the men's and the, in the women's. So we know already that in the women, uh, football, USA is one of the best teams in the world. So if it's come to beat soccer, the same project, the same structure, we're going to have surprises in the next tournament. I don't know if you agree with me. Yeah, of course. I think it's, it's important to not only have this tournament, to have a league in the future like other countries had, like El Salvador, like Bahamas. So I think also strengthening within the CONCACAF region where maybe we can play each other more, we can play El Salvador, we can play Bahamas. You know, all these things will help to make us stronger region. So I, I agree with you. I think uh, there's a lot of potential here. It's just, you know, everything aligning and, and, and working together for this goal. Very good, Francis. Uh, thank you for your participation. It was important for, for everybody to, to see a different way to develop and to run the sport. Thank you very much. So now, next slide, please. So now, I, I will present uh, the case of uh, Japan, the country that I, I, I work for three years, from 2014 to 2017. So next slide, please. Okay, Japan is a good, good uh, example to, to talk because there we have like all steps or all uh, infrastructure to develop the beach soccer. The only thing that when I had the, 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 the honor and the pleasure to implement there was the grassroots and the children clinics. I, I spoke before in the beginning of this presentation that uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this. So in Japan, we have the grassroots project with children, women and player clinics. We have professional formations. Normally, Japan hosts uh, one uh, AFC coaches course and referee and also one FIFA uh, coach and referee courses. Uh, local competition, we have a national tournament there. Uh, it's a short tournament, only three days. And we have a cup that they organize in one weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Okay, so the national team, Japan uh, JFA, the Japan uh, Football Association, they already have a good budget for the national team and allows the team to make uh, training camps inside Japan in different cities. Uh, international competition, Japan's always is participating in Mundialito, in different international tournaments, uh, and international training camps. That it's, uh, like Francis said, we, we went to US, we went to Bahamas, for example, before the World Cup to train and to compete against different teams. Uh, next one, please. Okay, so talking about the grass, grassroots and development. So when I arrived in Japan, the question was the average age of the national team 
players. So that time in 2014, the average was about 37, 38 years old, uh, the average for the players in the national team. And it was one request from Japan Federation for me to try to find new players. And then we create the clinics, uh, the project, and, but it wasn't only to find talents for the national team. So the idea was also, as you can see in the pictures, to teach kids, girls from different ages, okay? And also, uh, we invite some national teams to play there. Normally, it's before the, the, the World Cup qualifier or the World Cup itself. Next one, please. Okay, uh, now we're gonna talk about one of the biggest giant in beach soccer, Iran, country that I, I had the pleasure sometimes and sometimes was not a good experience to play against. But uh, Iran, for me, it's a, a country that developed the sports in a very good way. So here we can see in the first slide that they yearly organize a festival for under 14 uh, uh, kids in general, okay? They have a, a personal formation, a professional formation. I had the pleasure to, to go to Iran twice uh, for a FIFA course as an instructor. And uh, one of these courses uh, was for uh, the first women beach soccer course, course coaches course and it was an amazing experience, okay? So the national championship, they have youth league, second division league, first division league, and the premier league for men's and women's. It's important to say that uh, to, for one club, one team participate in the premier league, as I know, they must have a team under 20 and participate in the youth league, okay? So the national team, it's something Nice to talk because uh, Iran, they took some time to, to, to achieve uh, the top four in one World Cup, but they, they did. But unfortunately, they, they didn't qualify for the last one. So, but they always participate in uh, Intercontinental Cup. Uh, they are champion three times, AFC champion three times, and Asian Beach Games champion three times. So with all of these national activities in terms of tournament, you every year gonna see new players and new talents because they really work on that, okay? Uh, international events, so they, they organize the Persian Beach Soccer Cup and Eurasia Beach Soccer Cup uh, for international teams. So it was very nice step also. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about UAE. UAE is also a case that I, I will present because I was there seven years working for this uh, beautiful country. And UAE is a, a case a very uh, important case to talk because UAE is started when I spoke there in the beginning of the presentation in the opposite way. You remember that I, I, we spoke about the five ideals uh, process. UAE is completely different. So they started hosting the, the uh, Asian qualifier in 2006 and they didn't get a good result and in 2007, I came on board and not because of me, but because of the players' commitment and the support for the UEFA at that time, uh, UAE started to, to grow. And, and from 2007 to the last World Cup, the country missed only two World Cups. So from 2007, when I arrived there to 2012, was always a talk to start the league and finally, in 2012, the UAE launched the first UAE Beach Soccer League. And from that time, they host this tournament in different areas. And after the tournament was organized only in Dubai, 
uh, and we had the participation for many uh, clubs, football clubs in the league, and we had many foreigner players playing in the league, like Major, Jordan, uh, Meyer from Switzerland, uh, Bruno from Brazil. So we had many, many, many players that participate. Lorenz from Spain. So, and again, in the opposite way, national team and international competition. Uh, we can talk when we talk about international competition in in UAE. Uh, as I said, they organize some uh, qualifiers, but the biggest one and the one that every country wants to participate is the Intercontinental Cup, where we have the biggest teams in the world playing there, organized by Dubai Sports Council and BSWW. So it's amazing tournament. And again, everyone wants to be there. Next one, please. Okay, here we can see the activity. So coaches scores and referee scores. We had uh, normally every two years over there, now AFC also has the coaches course and referee course. So uh, UAE normally uh, hosts these kind of courses. Here we can see 2011, 2012 uh, beat soccer league, the first one in the history, or the one that Alahli was the first winner. Here, uh, the, the, the photo in the middle, down in the middle is uh, in Fujera one city like one hour and a half from Dubai, and they host one stage of the league over there. So next one, please. Again, talking about international events, we have this amazing uh, event because it's not only a tournament, it's one event, completely event, uh, where we have the Intercontinental Cup as a tournament. We have the season launch, workshop in Dubai, where we know the news, the projects for the future. We have good discussions about laws of the game, like last year, for example. And we have the season calendar, the next season calendar, where everybody is looking forward to know how many tournaments we're going to have. And we have the beach soccer stars night, the one all players and coaches dream to be award there. And it's amazing to have uh, amazing event also organized by BSWW and Dubai Sports Council. So again, it's a place that everyone wants to be normally in November. I don't know this year, how it will be, but November is the month that everyone dreams to be in Dubai. Next one. Okay, so thank you. It's a quick presentation about uh, Asia. And now we're gonna go to OFC. And I have the pleasure to invite this friend, Naya Bennett, the guy when I said that the World Cup in Bahamas wasn't good for me, it's because of Tahiti and him, you know, so what can I do? We played a beautiful game there, but we lost and it's part of the game. So, but uh, what I can say about Tahiti is uh, also a really good example about development and how to organize one World Cup, in my opinion, and I don't know the others, but in my opinion, it was one of the best ever. And I had the pleasure to be there staging full every night, people fighting to go inside. I really feel like I'm in Brazil in the 19 years where people wake up five o'clock in the morning to be inside the stadium. But I want to give the words to, to Bennett to better explain how is a very successful case we're going to see right now, how it works and what's the plan for the future. And I uh, thank you very much, my friend, to be here with us. Are you there, Naya? I think we had some connection problem.
Can you hear, uh, Naya? Can you hear us? Because we cannot hear you. Okay, so we are waiting for, for Naya to, to reconnect. When you are back, let me know, Naya, please. So I will just introduce a little bit, make the introduction here because I'm, I'm seeing the slides here. So Tahiti are normally organize coaching courses. So in 2018, uh, five days of training, 23 participants, including two women. Uh, okay. He's just said his signal is not good. So I'm trying to, to, to explain a little bit. Uh, in 2019, they organized also a coaching course in another place in Tahiti, uh, in Hanjiroa. I don't know if I'm explaining the name correctly. Uh, five days of training, 30 participants, including 11 women. Heffering course, Tahiti organized in 2018, five days course uh, with 31 participants, including seven women and from other four islands. Now it's not easy for me, but I will try Haetea, uh, Hanjiroa, Hurutu, and Takaroa. And in 2018 also, another course, five days, uh, 36 trainings, including five women and from other four islands also. Next slide, please. If we have uh, Naya Bet back, we're gonna, we're gonna put him again to, to better explain. Uh, okay, so they do festival since 2015, uh, where they play 11, uh, under 11 and under 13. 19 clubs from Tahiti, 240 kids participate in these tournaments. Four days activities, five different locations over the period Okay, he's back. Yorana, sorry from Tahiti. We have no, no problem, no problem. We are just in the second slide uh, talking about the grassroots, uh, Naya. You can go ahead from here or you want to, to go to the first one. You can go okay, ahead from just, here, right? To talk a little bit uh, of the first one, because I think in Tahiti, everything starts from the, the first slide. Uh, okay, we had, go ahead. I want to talk about the importance of having the coaches course because Tahiti, you know, it's a very small island and the main sport was football. So everybody was knowing only about football. Even if we have beaches, we have sand, but people, they play, they don't play beach soccer, they play football on the sand, like every, every kids. But we didn't know that there was a sport that we were playing beach soccer as a, a sport. So when we had the first uh, coaches course organized by the OFC, uh, we, we knew about this new sport for, for us. And of course we say, oh, it's a good sport for, for us. And it started 10 years ago. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity OFC uh, give us to, to, to know about uh, beach soccer. And since that day, now in Tahiti, we have a, a team. So we, I think it's the beach soccer course and the referring course are very important for, for Tahiti. So next, uh, next, please. So now in Tahiti, we have uh, the grassroots. We, we are uh, teaching uh, kids in schools. We have a uh, bit soccer for, for the women. So everything now is starting to, to move because we know that we, we need to, to stay focused on the, the development of beach soccer if we want to stay at a, a good level for us. So now it's easier for us to, to talk about beach soccer with different uh, category of ages. Next, please. National Championship, 
in Tahiti, in French Polynesia, for many of you who, who had the opportunity to come to, to Tahiti, uh, you have to know that we have uh, more than 120 islands all around the, the main island of Tahiti. So it's very difficult for us to, to have everybody at the same time in, uh, in Tahiti. But since uh, 2014, we organized it's like an Olympic, uh, Olympic Games, but in local in Tahiti with all different islands around the, in the Tahiti. And we, we had the, the football, it's football tournament, we call it Island Festival. So we play football, we play futsal, and now we play beach soccer. So it's a good opportunity for me as a national coach to, to see different players uh, from other islands of uh, Tahiti. So it's a very good uh, tournament for us. And it gives uh, the opportunity for the other island uh, outside of Tahiti to, to come to Tahiti and to play beach soccer with uh, good players uh, of uh, Tiki Toa. And we have also our national championship. We call it OPT Tour uh, since 2015. Uh, and we we see now that the the level is uh, increasing because uh, now uh, team from football they want to play beach soccer also so now we can say we have a, a good level i can say that because we were used to to travel to europe every summer time to participate in the national uh, championship in switzerland in italy in germany and now we can see that in Tahiti we have a good level as we have uh, in Europe. So it's, it's good for us and for the, the future of the, the national team. Next, please. Okay, now I have to talk about the, the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup. I heard uh, from you uh, that it was a, a very good uh, World Cup. And we can say it from ourselves too. For the national team, it was the the start because the we had a team from uh, 2011. We start with beach soccer. We had our first uh, World Cup in uh, Ravenna, Italy. So it was an opportunity to for us to to learn about beach soccer, to play against uh, Brazil, to play against Italy. This was the team that we were seeing only by TV. And uh, in 2011, we were in this world of beach soccer and we were discovering everything. So it was a, a good opportunity for us to prepare the, the national team, uh, the, the World Cup in 2013. So it was a, a, a great event. We, we did well, we had a good preparation. So I, I want to thank the, our FA who make a good work to prepare the team uh, correctly. And we, we had a good result. We finished at the, the first, uh, first place uh, in that World Cup. And to play the small final against Brazil was a very good gift for, for the, the people of Tahiti. So we are very happy with, uh, with this. And we have also, like in uh, international events, we have the qualifier. The RFC qualifier, we did it last, uh, last year for uh, the last World Cup. We organized it in Tahiti and it was a, a good event. But what I can say is we are in OFC, you don't have a lot of uh, country who, who play beach soccer. So it's a little bit difficult for, for us to, to have a good uh level matches so that's why for us it's very important to participate in international events when we receive invitation from beach soccer worldwide or from usa from japan we are very happy because you know tahiti is very far from everything uh, everything is expensive we have to travel the minimum it's five or six hour so it's a very difficult for us, but we take every opportunity we have and that the Beach Soccer Worldwide give us to have a good level uh, games uh, around the world. Next slide, please. 
can I, we talk about the, the, the life of the Tiki Pro national team? So as I mentioned, we start in 2012 with the, our first qualification for a World Cup. It happened in Ravenna in 2011. So then we had the, the World Cup. Uh, we organized it at home uh, uh, from uh, Tahiti. We finished fourth. Then we had uh, our third participation at the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup in Portugal. And that was very, very good for us. We, we finished at the second place, place uh, against uh, the local team, Portugal. It was a very good World Cup for us. And the, the people in Tahiti, they were very happy. They, they were, every, when we came back from uh, Portugal, everybody was at the airport and it was very new for us because we didn't expect, expect to, to, to finish second. So we said, okay, maybe it's, we, we were lucky. And we did it again in 2017, second, pl second place uh, again. And now we say, okay, we have uh, a good, uh, good team, so we have to stay focused uh, and to, to continue the, the development of, uh, of beach soccer. So these examples uh, show us that even if we are a small country, if we have a good focus and if we work in the good way, we can achieve a good uh, result. And to finish, we had also individual players award. As uh, in 2013, we have uh, Raymana Lifunqui who finished, uh, at, who, who gained the Adidas bronze medal. And in 2015, we had uh, Jonathan Torohia who won the Adidas Golden Glove, and Heimanu Tearui who, who won the Adidas Golden Ball. So for us, it was the good uh, good finish for for this world cup with this uh, individual uh, uh, rewards so we wanted to thanks really a good thanks to beach soccer worldwide and to the fifa to our federation who believes in us and who support us uh, very well so that's what i can say for for tahiti marcelo thank you Naya. thank you very much we have some some comments and question here for you. Uh, the first one, the first question is from coach Narciso from Portugal. Okay. Uh, he wants Hello. to know how many teams uh, participate in your national championship, how many, how many uh, clubs or teams, and how many games the Tahiti national team play in one year average. Okay, uh, in our national championship, I organize uh, three different categories. We have the first division. Uh, we have uh, eight teams in this, this good uh, division. Then we have the second division, same, eight team. And we have the, the women division, eight team. So this is what we have in our championship. Uh, now for the number of game uh, in, for, for Tahiti, it's, it depends. If it's a World Cup year, I can say in average we have maybe four, four or five games uh, to prepare the World Cup international game, I say. But if it's not a, a, bit, uh, a World Cup year, I can say we, have, we can have no, no match or maybe one. That's all. Okay. So it's really, it's really important, I think, uh, and I think Mr. Narciso also will agree that it's important for the region to develop more the beach soccer, right? To have more teams, because uh, as I know, we have Tahiti and we have uh, Salomon. Yes. That sometimes, Sol Salomon sometimes is in the World Cup also, but uh, it's important for the OFC region to develop a little bit more, right? More, more national teams, more, more clubs, and it we, for sure you have more games to play. Yes, we, we talk about uh, this with uh, OFC, and they they want to to, to develop the, the sport, so they are contacting they are contacting other countries, 
And for sure now we will have every year the the national uh, the OFC national tournament. So it's very good for us. It gives us the opportunity to to play. And uh, they ask uh, Tahiti if we can help other country. We say yes, of course. It's good for us to to develop this uh, this sport in in OFC and to have a good level in our in our zone. Yeah. Okay. So. Naya, I think it's again it's important for us. Here we we spoke about some some countries like Tahiti, like El Salvador, like UAE. Also, as you said, small countries that can achieve good results if they make a good project and a good development project in beach soccer, because the beach is there. Of course, we have big, uh, big teams I, uh, there, like Brazil, Portugal, but we can do something with a good project. So I was in Ravenna in 2011, and I watched Tahiti for the first time over there. And I was impressed, and a part of the result, my feeling was this team will go somewhere. And after that, of course, we, we cannot forget to mention the support that you had from Angelo, from Angelo Cirinzi, that yeah. he, he I, I, I'm sure he was very important uh, in, in all this process and the results that you had. So yeah. investment, uh, a good coach organizing everything. So I think it's, it's a good case to, to, for everyone to know. And I want to thank you very much. And I hope to see you soon, maybe surfing in Tahiti. No problem. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we are going to the, to the end for the second part of the Beat Soccer talk. And I want to thank you. Thanks, Beat Soccer Worldwide, for this invitation to be the moderator and also to give me the opportunity to speak about some countries that I had the pleasure to work, like Japan and UAE, for example. And, uh, and it's also very good to see the faces that we normally see uh, in person, uh, but it's good to see everyone here, good friends. I miss everyone. And again, thank you very much. Thank you for watching us, the second part that we're gonna finish today, okay? Mr. Luis, thank you very much. Francis, thank you. Naya, thank you. Fred, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to share this space with you. Thank you to all. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye.